Part 2, Chapter 5, Shadows of Past and Footprints of Liberation War Inside the outer perimeter of the wall of the jail, there are dozen or so prison cells divided by walls of their own, where inmates of two broad categories share the dystopian world but have different wish lists. Under trial, in short, UT, prisoners in legal parlance of the custody of the court, and those serving prison sentences. For us is the first category. The sought after escape route is through bail granted by the court. For me came good news. The high court in an exceptional move granted me bail, although this was not to happen under emergency rules. Barrister Rafiq, as I was told later, had placed my credentials relating to the liberation war on the table before the justices, which I guess influenced them in taking the unusual decision. The news brought mixed feelings for me. Being able to walk out of the hidden domain, join family and friends and the world beyond, the sea of humanity that flows through the wide boulevards, the roads, the lanes of the city, no question asked, is deliverance, and that too during emergency rule. But then I had a painful ache, a sense of loss for having traded my role in the war to get out of the tyranny of the jail, a trivial exchange. The celebratory moods among my cellmates were short-lived. Although the government lost no time to appeal against my bail and the full bench of the appellate division, having heard the arguments of the government, upheld the decision of the High Court granting me the bail. I was shown arrested under the fresh cooked-up case. Dooley came to receive her dad the next morning with many others, I'm sure, excited at the prospect of taking me home, only to be turned away at the jail gate. Crestfallen, she went back. I felt terribly sad for them. All their tenacious effort, days of running around in the labyrinth of the offices, seeking kindness from people they never dealt with, securing all the papers for my bail, and hope that they kept them going to see me free and finally disillusionment, a tangled world of deceit. Six months later, after my release from jail, I found the following message in my inbox from a colleague of mine who thought I had been set free. Dear Taufik Bhai, this is to say how happy and relieved I am of your release. Your surrender to the court has enhanced in our eyes your already acquired heroic and larger-than-life stature. When many otherwise strong people are on the run, you have decided to face life's fateful challenge head-on. I am truly proud to know and to have worked with a person of your caliber and your courage. Yours sincerely, Mahfuzul Islam. I feel lost at the turn of events. Is my freedom so threatening that it had to be stopped at any cost? Am I a terrorist who has to be confined within the four walls of the prison to secure the rest of the society? We are caught in the design of an evil force that came in the guise of an angel to liberate us from the grip of menacing forces, a country in chaos and on the brink of anarchy. Little did the nation suspect that it was a Trojan horse. Hounds on the leash can be safe gatekeepers, but let loose, they devour their masters. From predatory, we seem to have descended to the mafia state. I shall not lose hope. I am witness to many tumultuous moments of joys and sorrows, hopes and tragedies, rational and irrational twists. I cannot be broken, as I told Major H. Even if the gun is put on my temple, I am long past the terror that drove men to submission. A sudden reversal seemed to have turned the tables. The High Court has declared all allegations dating back to the past now being filed under emergency rule as a retrospective application of the law, and therefore null and void. Sheikh Hasina appears in the court in an exuberant mood, having heard the High Court ruling. The lawyers had brought a bouquet for her, which she gracefully accepted, and in her instinctive goodness, gives away one to me. I pass it on to Asma, sharing the rare trophy. The air of celebration in the courtroom is overwhelming, as if a bad dream is over and we are waking up to a new day at our journey's end. But then I feel sad for Sheikh Hasina, for what she is going through, though she is nonchalant about it. Can you imagine a woman, daughter of father of the nation, a former prime minister, 
is being held confined to a room in a secluded bungalow, away from any neighborhood and where armed personnel stand guard, hers is, in effect, solitary confinement compared to the conditions we are in. We all have cellmates, can go around occasionally and have a compound that at times opens to us. But she is all by herself, confined in a room of a building of a parliament area without the bare minimum for a decent stay. Not to speak of everything that is due to a former prime minister. The court has a broken leg, food and visitors are strictly rationed, and female guards are ordered to stay aloof. Are these machinations to break her will, her self-esteem, to broker a deal? Where are our tradition, decency, etiquette, and sense of honor? I had learned a few during the war, taught to the cadets in their military academy, flashed down the drain the abyss of sheer sinister designs. Sheikh Hasina, as she is, finds her way around this cloistered existence. In no time, she picks up companionship with the female guards by starting conversation with them. Initially restrained, they give in to her warmth and genuineness, tell their stories of their homes and families, their aspirations, and apologize for what is being meted out to her. They become her friends, the barriers fall apart, they help oil and braid her hair. There are other happenings in Nazimuddin Road. Kayum, ward commissioner of Kafrul, died of heart attack at 8.45 a.m. in cell 7, just next to ours on the western side, at the age of 40 years or so. Ignoring the rule, I walk over the cell, which can barely accommodate a bed on the floor, but is in fact shared by three prisoners. Kayum was detained for a year without any charge, subsequently released by the High Court but arrested again on his way out at the jail gate in mid-December of the previous year. His young daughters kept waiting for him on that day, rushing to the door at the sound of any passing vehicle, helping their mother lay out their father's choices on the table, waiting for dad to join them at lunch after a year of absence. Their moment of joy was snatched away at the jail gate on a charge that never was. Shocked and disillusioned at the incomprehensible design that denied him freedom at the last moment, Kayum became withdrawn, melancholy, sort of a recluse since then. Kayum was declared dead on his way to the hospital. I'm told it's customary to keep jail records straight. No one dies inside the jail. There are stories of handcuffs being put on dead inmates, taken in an ambulance to nearest hospital only to be pronounced dead. Joshim, the Faltu who attended my chores, is waiting to get out. His bail has been granted. The excitement is all over his face, a bit guilty though for abandoning us to our fate. Joshim's world is defined by his mother, who reared him up selling pita on the roadside of Iskaton. In the absence of a father he never saw or heard of, tenaciously laboring through the legal system, all Greek to her, with ambushes abundant to rob her of small means and her will. Joshim's mom never gave up. I have been hearing accounts of the complex and treacherous world of judicial dispensation from no less than a son of a judge, Fahmi, my son-in-law. But then, finally, she has beaten the system and secured her son's freedom. All is not lost. Mizan recognized me at first sight, although, given my many limitations among them, storing recognition, I could not recall him. On enquiry, he narrated his story. Well into retirement from public service, even before me, Mizan, now 65, had been living a quiet life in suburban Uttara with his wife and his only son. Their daughter with her toddler son had come to visit the family, escaping the harsh winter of Washington, USA, where her husband works as a software engineer in the lab of Microsoft. The otherwise lingering hours of retirement were now filled with busy schedules, among them endless games with his new playmate, his grandson. Mizan was heading for the mosque for the noontime prayer when he saw some law enforcing personals in the apartment complex. He scattered them since he had no reason for any interference with them. On his return from the mosque, he was stopped and questioned at the apartment gate about stolen Vishnu Murti, meaning statue of Vishnu, artifacts found missing recently as they were being transported to Dhaka airport for shipment to Guimet Museum in France as exhibits on loan. Some pieces of earthenware, assumed to be broken parts of the lost Vishnu Murti, mostly are actually made of black stone called Koshti Pathor by the overzealous investigators had been found among the garbage next to his apartment. 
Mizan, who had read about Vishnu Murthy making headline news and wave of public protest about the shady way government had dealt with the incident, felt lost at their questioning. He tried to argue that these earthen pieces could be well be a picture left by some households or missing statue, as reported in the press, was made of black stone. The next best shot was convincing the law enforcing agency that he was a retired government official leading a quiet life away from the bustle of the city and had no earthly reason to even vaguely associated with the museum pieces lost on the way to the airport. But that was not good enough. As a Stan family looked on, he was put into a waiting police van, denied lunch already served on the table, and whisked away. After a night in hell, what was the parlance of the law enforcer the questioning cell? He was shown arrest for the theft of artifacts and found his way to the ground floor of Rupsha, meant for less honorably accused without division. The government's press release the next morning touted the progress made in investigation and several arrests made, among them Mizan. After several months, in jail without any charges and legal expenses that ate away much of his lifetime saving, Mizan was set free. In the meantime, his daughter and grandson, having seen him at weekends at jail for short spells, their vacation gifts from the government, had to leave for the USA. I spent 21st February in a forlorn manner. This day symbolizes our roots, the people that we are, our language, culture, ethos and legacy. The Pakistanis wanted to rob us of our inheritance some 60 years ago. Mr. Jinnah, founder governor general of Pakistan, declaring in Dhaka that Urdu would be the state language of Pakistan. And then East Pakistan rose in union to protest. A peaceful procession of students was gunned down by the police in Dhaka, killing a few, including Jabbar, Borkot, Rokfik, Salam, on 21st February 1952. I recall having joined, then in primary school, the protest march of students calling for a general strike in the remote town of Noga, where lanterns lit up the nights and the lone paved road defined the township, chanting full-throated slogan in rhythm. Rashtra Bhasha Bangla Chai E Dabite Dharma Ghat Lal Dhakar Rajpat We want Bangla as the state language. The strike is to realize the demand. Dhaka's avenues are red with blood. I can still see the small kid that I was, wearing shorts, marching in columns, close-fisted arms raised along with others, being part of a crowd that lent to the strength I had never fathomed, a warning from a kid's no man's lands between fairy tale and reality to some unknown demons, threatening in dire consequences, a premature coming of age, closing my eyes, I can still feel the thrill. As we grew up, 21st February became part of our consciousness, embedded in our psyche, a defining moment that we would look back to discover ourselves anew many different ways through the movement of 1960s for self-realization and finally our independence through the War of Liberation in 1971. Almost half a century later, Rofikul Islam, bearing the same name as the one of the martyrs of the language movement of 1952, a Bangladeshi living in Vancouver, Canada, took up the cause of mother language and wrote to then UN Secretary General Kofi Annan in 1998, asking him to take the initiative to save many languages spoken in the world from extinction. He suggested that 21st February be declared as the International Mother Language Day, citing the supreme sacrifices made by Bangladeshis on the same day in 1952. The spirit had lived long enough and beyond the boundaries of Bangladesh to inspire a Bangladeshi to raise the voice for many forgotten denizens, marginalized by the more powerful languages of the world. Sheikh Hasina, then in office as Prime Minister, not only endorsed the proposal, but mobilized our diplomatic corps in the US and Europe to vigorously pursue it. This was vindicated when the General Conference of the United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization, UNESCO, through a resolution in 1999, proclaimed 21st February as the International Mother Language Day to be observed worldwide annually to promote awareness of linguistic and cultural diversity and multilingualism, our small footprints on the global canvas. Today, moments past midnight, people had laid wreaths at the Shohid Minar, located at the dividing line between Old and New Dhaka, as if our souls have been stitched together across time. 
children, men and women will stand and wait for hours in long meandering lines with bouquet and wreaths to be laid at the foot of the mausoleum as they have done for years. One of the iconic songs being played in the background. <laughs> Can I forget 21st February and his written in blood of our brother? I don't know how. The day is being observed today in other countries, but I'm sure the voices will be louder in future. As if bereavement and romance are in parlays, 21st February is also beginning of spring when Krishnachura, Palash and Shimul burst forth with their fiery blossoms, ushering in regeneration with herbs all their own. I anxiously wait for Talesman, the tender southerly breeze that carries romantic message from another world, soft and caring, whispering, breathing vigor into man and nature, age no bar. Trees in our campus have been varied rendezvous. With spring, their body clocks set differently. Some, like the mango trees, have just started flowering, while the neem, dressed in fresh white leafy look, is ready to serenade the season. Others, like Kat Golap, also called Plumeria, to our north, in front of the hospital, is in waiting mode. It's strung garnelled with scarred skin and knotty veins, stretching out the bare branches as if asking for deliverance, reminding one of the fairy tale giants buried underneath the earth, and others yet to shed their leaves, surreptitious ways like beautiful bells avoiding the weary eyes of strangers, or those who have vowed to remain green forever, rain or shine. But then, eternal youth is insipid compared to the cycle of existence, where life reasserts itself, rasphotically, with all its warmth and beauty, without ever lamenting the death it has to overcome. I'm brought back from a review of the radio broadcasts of the events of today, laying of the wreaths by the chief advisor of caretaker government and other dignitaries. Children, men and women lined up in waiting, music in the background, balmy spring dawn welcoming the day as it has done for decades, as if nothing has changed. Or has it? With Sheikh Hasina incarcerated and the country on hold, is there no more to it than meets the eyes? Is the day, or for that matter, our history being hijacked in such a subtle way that we cannot discern the criminality? I take a broad sweep of history and try constructing a narrative that will explain our intriguing today. Former Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina in jail and another, Khaled Azia, rumored to be about to go behind bars. Politicians, public officials, business leaders incarcerated, mostly on trumped-up charges. A civilian government in power with support of army, civil society, leading NGOs, a section of mainstream media, foreign powers, and international agency. What is it all about? Can history be any guide? A drift to the distant past and come upon the trends that seem to run the cyclical modes between the noble and the ugly, the good and the bad. There are occasions when history wanted to set things right. For example, when Dhaka was being Christianed as the Mughal provincial capital, the Treaty of Westphalia of 1648 ended long-running European wars of religions over more than a century, establishing the concept of sovereign states and creating the basis of national self-determination. Beyond the shores of Europe, the Westphalian principles became central to the world order that had developed over centuries and remain in effect even today. My chain of thoughts is interrupted by Nikhil, our cellmate and engineer, pulls up a chair next to me and asks, somewhat teasingly, Sir, most inmates address me, Sir, since perhaps I am the oldest among them and have occupied the highest offices of civil bureaucracy, although incarceration had been a great leveler. Sir, how do you feel with all the happenings of Ekushe going on, just like any other year? No one misses you? Nikhil, our generation, is on its way out. Does it matter whether we are counted or not? More importantly, the question is, what are we destined for the future? After a pause, hoping that Nikhil, who seems to enjoy reading, might have glanced through the world history, I continue. 
I was reflecting on the lessons of the past, for instance. One of the core outcomes of the Treaty of Westphalia, centuries back, the principle of national self-determination, also the basis of our independence. This was followed by a period of characterized by Western historian as the Age of Enlightenment, a European narrative when reason and empiricism dominated the deliberations of its scholars in the philosophy and scientific inquiries. This brought forth political modernization of West and the creation of modern liberal democracies. Big names, pathfinders like Bacon, Descartes, Locke, Spinoza, Voltaire, Rousseau, and Kant were the fountainheads of this period. You must have heard some of these names. But then this eponymous era of light did cast dark shadows on many parts of the world. Nikhil seems confused and asked, how could light cast darkness? I do not understand. I guess this will be clear if I finish my arguments. These nobler principles were left on the waysides subsequently as the European power went on to colonize the world. The lights were not carried by the colonies. On the contrary, the industrial revolution that followed its heels, discovery of steam engine being a case in point, helped the colonizers to sail to distant places and rob them of their wealth and ship them back home. India became the jewel in the crown. Can you imagine? Such an enlightened society endorsed a company with royal charter, the East India Company, to resort to any means, brute force, chinchery, bribery, no holes barred, to enrich itself and share the booty to the crown. With Durant, an academician of repute, set aside his mission to write the story of civilization as he stepped into India and instead wrote a book that laid open the greatest crime in all history. Another economic historian estimated that when British came, India contributed about a quarter of the world's income. By the time they left, after about 200 years, the share had dropped to only 3%. Bengal was the richest in India. Our legendary muslin was a sought-after privilege of the royals. It was all but gone. At its cost, textile flourished in England. Our size pumped into their hearts. The Brits forced us to cultivate opium in place of grain and exported the opium to China to keep Chinese drugged, a criminal enterprise endorsed by the crown. While they robbed us of our wealth, shipped them back home, stripped our culture, heritage and above all, our dignity by laying to waste the vibrant civilization, they then undertook to civilize us and the white man's burden. What an outrageous concoction of history. Liberal democracies, rights of man et al. were left for safekeeping on European soil. You see, history as written and handed down to us is replete with contradictions, more appropriately, hypocrisy. I guess you know that anyone accused of duplicity is still shamed in the villages of Bangladesh, calling them British. Our ordinary folks have better memories. Nikhil is visibly outraged. But he has a question too. Why didn't we drive them out? In the oceans they sailed across? We too have our own destiny. Why did we let British do these terrible things to us? The East India Company spread its tentacles across India steadily, adopting means without scruples. They bought on and won over some Nawabs and Maharajas and dethroned others divided the country along religion and ethnic lines. In short, sowed the seeds of dissension, mistrust and animosity. Untangling the mischief and organizing the nationwide resistance movement in a huge country like India was an almost impossible task. There was an attempt in 1857, after a century that British termed as a sepoy mutiny. Indians serving British garrisons in Meerut, only about 50 miles away from Delhi, rose in rebellion, which quickly spread along north and northeastern India 
while soldiers in other garrisons either remain neutral or in sidelines, and yet others lend support to East India Company. The rebel chose Bahadur Shah Zafar, an ailing old poet and a lover of music and art, the nominal Mughal emperor confined in the port of Delhi as their leader and rallied behind him. The decrepit Delhi fort and its residents were but the remnant of bygone era. The old Emperor Bahadur Shah Zafar, taking a breath from his ghazal sessions, looked out through the window of the palace. Soldiers streaming in from desperate garrisons, raising slogans in his name, as if he was witnessing a scene out of a work of fiction, not knowing what to do, it was only a matter of time the company troops would take control of the situation, hang the rebels, tens of thousands, and send Bahadur Shah Zafar ignominiously into exile in Rangoon, Burma, not leaving behind any vestige of the past glory that India could rally around again. Bahadur Shah Zafar died as a commoner, wrote in his own epitaph, an emperor's companion on the final journey, a poem. How unfortunate is Zafar for his burial, not even a yard of land where to be had, in the land of his beloved. In the aftermath of the rebellion, the East India Company's interest in India were taken over by the British Crown. Our conversation turns lugubrious. Nikhil recovers from his pensive mood and comments. I wish Bahadur Shah Zafar was younger and could provide leadership. Then the rebellion could have got a momentum. In reply, I add, here comes the importance of leadership. The independence of Bangladesh is an example. It was preceded by years of political preparation, mobilization of people of all shades and above all, the single-minded and unwavering leadership of Sheikh Mujib who never relented in his dream against all kinds of risk, intimidation, incarceration, and finally being sentenced to death by his adversaries. This happens once in a lifetime of a nation. Nikhil goes on to prepare a cup of tea for me, and one for himself. This is a luxury that I crave for in the morning. After a good sip, I resume. Nikhil there were other armed protests even prior to the Sepoy Rebellion. Titumi led a peasant uprising against the Zamindar and the British colonial authorities in Bengal. This short-lived protest came to an end when his fort, made of bamboo, was stormed by British soldiers. Titumi died of wounds in November 1831. Titumi's story passed into Bengali legend. Academic institutions still carry his name in Dhaka, as also outside. Another small protest, Neil Bidroho, better known as Indigo Revolt, of February and March 1859 in Bengal when farmers refused to sow indigo in their field to protest against the exploitative farming by the British. It was ruthlessly suppressed by the British administration. This revolt features in a Bengali play, Neil Dorpon, written by Dino Bundhu Mitro, there are other instances too. The youngest revolutionary was Khudiram, 19 years of age, who attempted to assassinate a cruel British magistrate, was captured on the run, arrested, and in farcical proceedings that lacked evidence, was sentenced to death. Khudiram went to the gallows smilingly in 1908. I guess you know the incident in Chittagong. Armed independence fighters led by Shu Shen raided the armory of the police and auxiliary forces in Chittagong in 1930. He too was hanged by British in 1934 after inhuman torture at the hands of the police. Nikhil interjects, How did Bahadur Shah Park end up in Dhaka? I have gone past it in Shodorghat near Buriganga. It's not in good shape though. Reminds me of an incident long ago, I replied. On the vacation from Dhaka to Borishal, where the rest of the family was staying, my elder brother, Kudrot, Mejobhai, was all agitated while narrating an exciting moment. 
He was a student of Notre Dame College and staying at the Baptist Mission Hostel in Shadurghat next to what was then the Victoria Park. This was a place from where the accession of Queen Victoria as the Empress of India had been announced with much fanfare and sadly also the place where the British publicly executed by hanging the rebels of the uprising of 1857. On the centenary of the rebellion the students of Dhaka University marched in procession pulled down the name of Victoria and announced that henceforth it would be called Bahadur Shah Park in the memory of an emperor who was not given a place or burial in India Meju Bhai was among the cheering crowd witnessing according to him a small but symbolic correction of history Nikhil clapped his hand, leaned forward to hear the rest of the my story, while putting a question. I'd like to hear how these happenings of the past relate to our days. I'm also trying to find a narrative to understand our present. Although we tend to focus on the present, you cannot make a worthwhile judgment unless you relate to the past and guess what the future might hold. Let me go back. to what i was narrating in the wake of development in the west the enlightenment colonization and exploitation came the french revolution with new promises democracy secularism and declaration of rights of man and more we did not hesitate to borrow from the intellectual ideas bequeathed in the west some of the ideals of the french revolution resonate in our proclamation of independence too You may reason such adaptation as a surrender to European values, a contradiction to what I have argued all the while. But remember, India and Bengal in particular has been an eclectic region, absorbing ideas from far and wide. Its amorphous landscape and moist earth never wanting in regeneration. Nikhil becomes attentive as I carry on. The two world wars in modern times turned the world upside down. Sheer rivalry among kings and monarchs cost tens of millions of lives in World War 1. Clash of nationalist expansionism and colonial interests saw mayhem on a global scale in World War 2. The world was carved out among the victors. After each of the wars where principles were sacrificed at the altar of power, territory and influence. But then there are promising developments in their aftermath. Independence movement across the globe and the birth of international organization. From conflict to cooperation. Nikhil interjects, I'm impressed and feel he is on the same page with me. as i continue yes these global outcomes did cast their shadows over our part of the world a more idealist us president franklin delano roosevelt was able to convince an imperialistic winston churchill to give up his vision of an empire after world war 2 this subcontinent was partitioned between india and pakistan in 1947 Five years later, he rose in unison to secure our mother tongue in 1952. From the machinization of Pakistan, an absurd marriage thrust upon us by the Raj. Nikhil adds, There was some initial gain nevertheless. We got the Brits out. I reserved my comments, for I have much more to say and continue. In a dialectic response to the mountains of corpses a global architecture evolved in the wake of the last great war for promoting peace and security among nations the united nations and the britain woods institutions for the creation of a dynamic world community in which the peoples of every nation would be able to realize their potential in peace sounds great But then it is no secret that the ambitions of hegemony of the big powers was never tamed 
and continued unabated. Before the ink dried up of the UN Charter and the US formulated the most potent international policy. National Security Council Report 68 of 1950 Pursued by the subsequent US administration for almost half a century, providing the blueprint for a militarization of the Cold War till the collapse of Soviet Union in the early 1990s. Sadly, the acronym MAD, Mutual Assured Destruction, the outcome of the arm race between the US and the Soviet Union. Nuclear arsenal on both sides threatening the extinction of each other in case of conflict and eerie safeguard for peace is more a script of horror movie than a tribute to global diplomacy. I can see impatience in Nikhil's eye. He wants to get down to now, to understand his fate stands in the murky world and butts in. Do this relate to our history? I assure him, there is no shortcut in the footprints of history. We may at times feel as if we are pawns in the hand of a hidden power, but then we need to uncover. I continue. You think we could stay out of the prying eyes of others, since we do not matter much? But events which seem to be local and inconsequential get amplified to draw larger attention, like it or not. Though on the fringes, we could not stay out of the specter of rivalry of the big powers and their shifting alliances. You remember our liberation war in 1971. The US administration enamored the fledgling detente with China brokered by President General Yahya of Pakistan was so blinded that it dismissed our struggle for independence as a thorny sideshow and lent all its support to a brutal regime. At the fag end of the war, we heard of the US 7th Fleet moving towards Bangladesh in the Bay of Bengal. They thought we would be intimidated. You know our reaction? We laughed it away. And then the freedom fighters had taken over most of the countryside of Bangladesh and anyone trying to cross swords with us would have to have their boots on the ground. In fact, we were, at that time, hunting for targets in Kushtia since the enemy had retreated to fortified positions, abandoning most of their advance outposts. They had stopped patrolling, had no listening posts for early warnings. What is called, in tactical terms, became blind. We laid an ambush for the whole day along Meherpur Koshkundi Road, but not a single vehicle could be sighted. Hearing us talking about the Liberation War, Zafar, a shy young politician, son of a freedom fighter, asks if he could join. I'm happy to get one more in audience. Zafar, who lost his father at a young age, is keen to hear the detail of the war how it was fought on the ground, imagining his father among the freedom fighters. Welcome, Zafar. You know your father could have been with us. We had become desperate to have encounters with the Pakis. Our tactics was to assemble at an agreed rendezvous, finish a mission and then melt away like fish in the water. But we didn't let our guards down. If we happened to select a refuse, stay in a school, the villagers would come forward with food for us. That's how we were received. But then, as night fell, we packed up and moved away some distance and occasionally slept on furrowed grounds, under the open sky, lest someone would give our location away. We had watchers up the high trees with torches and drums to alert us of any impending danger during the night. So, could you get any targets? Zafar was keen to know the details. Yes and no. On one occasion, we audaciously wanted to get close and find their whereabouts. With a small group, we headed for the river bank with the enemy on the other side. Normally such reconnaissance was done by intelligence unit of our camp. 
but we were impatient for action. While two groups gave cover from the hidden positions, I volunteered to do the job, borrowed a cow from a farmer and took it for grazing along the river bank. I was wearing a lungi and a straw hat for camouflage. I could see the park army standing 100 yards across and their bunker locations. All of a sudden, my men started waving secretly at me, signaling me to return. I couldn't understand their anxiety, nor could I run away, for that would surely alert the enemy, and I would be gone. I held my nerve and walked slowly towards safety, but before I could go far enough, a burst of gunfire hissed past me. I dashed to the ground, let the cow go, while my boys returned fire. While fires were being exchanged, crawling fast, I returned to safe location. What was wrong? Zafar asked. It's funny, although I had camouflaged as a farmer, my gait and my handling of the cow were so different that a villager with the sympathy for the Pakis would easily find out that this wasn't a farmer. That must have happened. I narrowly escaped death. Thank heaven you moved away in time. It's true, I can easily differentiate a village folk from a city dweller. Zafar sighs as if he just managed to get away from a bad dream. But we were not about to give up. One night, hoping to draw the enemy out in the open, we laid an ambush around the Poradaho rail junction. Our boys went about laying charges to blow up the railway lines. I dare say, with impunity, only 150 yards from the enemy bunkers. The track shone in the moonlight as if resting from the day's work. Moments later, they were blown apart, pieces flying into the air as we took cover. The enemy opened up the aimless fire, telling us they were jittery. We stood on the track, calling names. I called out, Son of a bitch, here we stand, face us if you dare, enticing them to come out of the bunkers. Boys covering us opened fire. Before we withdrew, the Pakis remained holed up. I was happy to recall the miserable plight of an army which had bragged about its martial past. When they were finally retreating, we were on their trail, though some distance behind. I sent one of their trusted persons, I mean a collaborator, who was keen to get into our good books. A motorbike with a cheat asking them to surrender and assuring treatments under Geneva Convention. But they wouldn't surrender to the muktis, as they called us in short. I guess, having committed murders and rapes, they couldn't, in their heart, expect fair treatment. Alas, Puradaho station was a witness to their miseries and humiliation. In the final hours of the retreat, with their supply lines completely broken, with no firewood, they ate flour mixed with water, which their stomachs revolted against. Stuck with diarrhea, they had defecated on the platform so badly that we could not stand the stink as we entered it. I laughed to add my punchline. We got the shit out of them. Nikhil and Zafar burst out laughing. Serving them right, they shout in chorus. The Seventh Fleet was a huge war machine, I'm told. An armada of ship with an aircraft carrier at the core. They could fly fighters and bombers from the fleet to bomb you. Were you not all scared? Nikhil inquires with curiosity. Nikhil, you are right and also wrong. Yes, they could fly out and technically bomb us. But then we were elusive targets, melting away in the embroidered quilt of village, grain fields and rivers, regrouping in short notice, whenever we wanted to. They couldn't find any target, nor could they bomb the whole of Bangladesh. If they dared come on shore, it would be their death knell. Just like the Pakis. This was our turf, and the fight would have to be with the small arms. With the odds 
heavily against them. They had, by then, learned that dearly in the Vietnam War. Yang Zafar, who could well have been my son, hesitates and put his inquiry to me. The U.S. could have gone on to lend support to Park Army instead of getting involved directly. How could that play out? A game changer? You're smart, Zafar. I give him a pat on his back and continue. The Pakistan army was just expecting that support and the muscle flexing of the U.S. But the U.S. had its own assessment too. The Pakis were on their knees and who could bet on such a demoralized force? Had the U.S., say for the sake of argument, gone the whole hog, bringing China along, then India and the Soviet Union would have to also close ranks, a recipe for world war. The Pakis, Janta, and its army, knowing them for what they are, would have cheered for such coalition to take all others down with them. That were highly improbable scenario, I dare say, impossibility. People of the U.S. and the world would have reigned Washington even if Nixon and Kissinger wanted to go down that insane path. Later, Henry Kissinger, National Security Advisor to U.S. President Nixon, derided the birth of Bangladesh and contemptuously termed it as international basket case. We were an affront to their global ambitions. The conscience of the world powers went into hibernation when we were fighting the battle for our life, except for India, the Soviet Union, and of course, the people of the world. George Harrison and Ravi Shankar sang at Madison Square Garden in order to draw the world attention to our struggle. Quakers blocked ships with dingy boats carrying arms and ammunition to Pakistan at Baltimore Port. Henri Malarox, a French novelist and humanist, stood by our side. The list goes on. I had the privilege of showing the young U.S. Senator Ted Kennedy around the border and that too in the captured M38 Jeep. He had to personally see for himself the plight of refugees and assess our resolve for independence. You mean to say that the people of U.S. were not supporting the stances of U.S. administration? I thought these democracies have strong accountability. Nikhil observes with surprise. Nikhil, democracy at home and policy abroad have quite often been a variance in the modern history of Western countries. Didn't I make it clear this morning? Some of those who opposed the independence didn't stop at it. The defeated forces of our war couldn't bear to see Bangladesh, an anathema to them. Stand on its feet from the ruins of inheritance led by its architect Bongobondhu. You, Nikhil, were a kid and Zafar, not even born, when we got liberated in 16 December 1971. Close to 100,000 Pakistani armed personnel surrendered at the race course of Dhaka. Gone was their martial bravado. An ignominious end to their exploitation and duplicity. But then they had followed a scorched earth policy. While in retreat, burn, destroy and loot, leave nothing for Bangladeshis to stand on. Let them own a land they cannot be proud of. Even in the final moments of defeat, their collaborators went from house to house, picked up the best of our minds, academics, literatures, poets, professional, artists, journalists, anyone with fame, slaughtered them, dumped their bodies on the marshy swamp in Mirpur, then on the outskirts of Dhaka. I had mixed feelings of joy and sadness recalling those days. Take a few moments to regain my composure before resuming again. After the war, I came back home like tens of thousands of freedom fighters, traumatized with the memories of a bloody war, comrades in arm who did not make it to the promised land, my elder brother, 
and Buddy gone, not knowing where my mother was, with my two younger brothers, yet euphoric of the victory, dreamy-eyed about the future. When Bongobun returned from incarceration in Pakistan, having been on death row during the entire period of the war, Bangladesh was a wasteland. The wet earth smelled only of blood and tears. Ten million refugees, most literally destitute, were packed up in their miserable camps in India and streaming back home. My mother with her kin was in one of those refugee camps along the border when my father went away to join the freedom fight. She saw my father only after Bangladesh was liberated. Add Zafar, a glow and happy to be part of the story. A pall of sadness had befallen Nikhil. He looked sad and withdrawn. Nevertheless, I continue. The way Indians received the refugees is a rare example of how far one can go to help fellow human beings. Mind you, not so long ago, in 1947, in the aftermath of Macabre riots, Followed the partition of India, tens of thousands of Hindus were driven out of East Pakistan, many of whom took shelter and, and then resided along the border in India. These same people were welcoming refugees from Bangladesh, giving them shelters by squeezing their own living space, sharing their meager food with strangers. Millions in the camps outnumbered the local populations. Eventually, the Indian government took the responsibility, but their resources were strained to the limits. Nikhil stares and slowly joins the conversation. I didn't want to open old wounds, but since you mentioned them, let me share my own story. The partition of India in 1947 came at a monumental cost in blood. The communal Hindu-Muslim riots that followed turned friend against friends, neighbor against neighbor, communities against communities, an insane holy in war smeared the subcontinent, never witnessed before. Except for a few of us in our village, all the Hindus fled to India, leaving home and hearth, almost as destitute. My grandfather stayed back with his family, hoping for sanity to return. But 1971, came with a vengeance. Nikhil pauses. His sad eyes seem to float away, gone to some distant time. His voice cracks as he tries to put together his emotions and speak. This is what my mother shared with me. It was May 1971. The Pakistan army had retaken control after their initial losses at the hands of Mukti Bahini and was fanning out all over Bangladesh. My mother had gone to collect water from the nearby river. Around noon time, when she heard screams coming from the village and saw the mud house going up in flames, terrified, she hid on the bank of the river. I was with her, as I always did, tagging along. After an hour or so, with the village still resonating with wails, she returned only to discover the littered corpses of men, women and children. None of our family members was left alive. My father was among them. The Pakistani army had burned and razed the village to the ground, butchered its residents and taken away few young girls. My mother lost her consciousness at the hellish scene. The surviving villagers decided to head for safety to India. This time, it was Hindus and Muslims together. I was the only family companion of my mother, a young woman in her early 20s. The refugees streaming to India had found a trek along the village path, away from the prying eyes of the Pak army, a long winding journey on foot, still fraught with dangers of sudden appearance of the hordes. In a bag that contained belongings of our lifetime, we moved along the caravans of refugees joining from all directions. It took my mother five days to reach the Indian border, but many could not make it, died of starvation, exhaustion, 
or sheer old age, their bodies left by the wayside, who could bury or cremate them and where? Zafar's eyes glistened with tears. I could recall vividly similar scenes etched in my soul. We were out on a guerrilla mission, a dark night made darker with ominous clouds breaking the streaks of lightning, bringing into vision for a split second an unending beeline of humanity, men, women, children, young and old, on foot, on the shoulders, on the backs, drenched in rain, half-naked, trudging towards an unknown deliverance. Dante's inferno frozen on a black canvas. I have seen abundant bodies, dead and alive, by the village paths, a haunting apparition. Maybe little Nikhil was holding on to his mother in one of those caravans. Nikhil pauses and takes a deep breath. I do not interrupt. Let him have his catharsis. We did not have any relatives or acquaintances in India. My mother hid her caste to take up a job of a maid in a kind household where we stayed till the war was over. We returned home to Bangladesh. Our village was but a burnt out swathe. The young girls abducted from the village never returned. He sighs, cast a blank look around and adds, I was the apple of her eye. My mother eked out a living, sacrificed her life to take care of me. I became an engineer and even got a scholarship to do PhD in Texas, A&M. I couldn't leave my mother behind. And now, here I'm in jail. Heaven knows why. Our conversation draws to an end. As reality brings us home, it is court day for Nikhil. <laughs>